Have you ever wondered who could destroy a concrete dam, drain a lake, or leave entire regions without a harvest, without having either dynamite or an excavator? Meet a small, hard-shelled creature that turns this into reality. Not the plot of a disaster movie. The Red Swamp Crayfish, a true terminator of the arthropod world, has gone from a favorite delicacy of Louisiana Cajuns to a global threat to biodiversity. It survives where everything else dies and devours everything that appears in its path. The story of the red swamp crayfish began in the murky warm waters of the Mississippi River Basin and along the shores of the Gulf of Mexico. For centuries it was part of the ecosystem of the American South, where local people learned to live with it in harmony and even turned it into a culinary idol. But human greed and short-sightedness opened the mythic box of Pandora. People decided that they could control nature and started shipping the crayfish to Europe, Asia and Africa for its tasty meat, never realising that they were unleashing a perfect biological invasion machine. Take a closer look at this guy. Its shell is usually dark red or burgundy, as if it has already been boiled, but that impression is deceptive. That colour is a signal of danger and aggression. Adults reach only about 10 to 12 centimetres in length, but do not let the size fool you. Inside that compact body hides the power of a bulldozer and the endurance of a marathon runner. The main superpower of the red swamp crayfish is its incredible ability to dig burrows. These are not just little holes in the sand, they are complex engineering structures. In the dry season, when the swamp dries up, it does not die like an ordinary fish or crayfish. It goes deep underground and seals the entrance with a plug of soil. There, in the cool dampness, it can wait for the rain for months. These burrows can go one and a half and even two meters deep. Imagine thousands of such miners all starting to drill into a riverbank or an earthen embankment at the same time. The soil structure turns into Swiss cheese. It loses strength. And at the very first flood, it simply washes away, opening the way for the water. This very habit makes it enemy number one for irrigation systems and rice fields. In Spain and Italy, farmers throw up their hands when they see the characteristic muddy chimneys sticking out of the ground like smokestacks of miniature factories. That is a sure sign that water will soon drain from the field and the roots of the rice will be ruthlessly clipped by claws. It is amazing, but the red swamp crayfish can breathe air. Well, almost. Its gills are built so that as long as they stay moist, the crayfish can calmly travel over land. It has no trouble crawling from one pond to another, covering several kilometers across the night dew to take over new territory. It is completely undemanding when it comes to water quality low oxygen levels that would kill a native noble crayfish in a matter of minutes are no problem at all for our hero. It simply rises to the surface and starts using atmospheric air, sticking part of its body out of the water like a tiny submarine in snorkel mode. Salinity is not an insurmountable barrier for it either. Even though it is a freshwater species, the red crayfish tolerates the brackish waters of river mouths and lagoons very well. This flexibility lets it colonize niches that other species do not even attempt to enter, creating bridgeheads for further advance deep into continents. Let us move to Louisiana, the homeland of our hero. Here it is treated with respect and even affection. The state is literally obsessed with crawfish. In spring, when the water in the rice fields warms up, the season of big hunts and big feasts begins. Here the crayfish is not a pest, it is the basis of a multi-million dollar industry. Farmers in Louisiana came up with a brilliant dual-use scheme for their land. In summer, they grow rice, and in fall, after the harvest, they flood the fields again to let the crayfish that have been sitting in burrows under the plant roots all season come out. The rice feeds people, and the leftover stalks feed the crayfish. It is a zero-waste production system. The catch is made with special traps that locals call wire pots. These are wire cylinders with funnel-shaped entrances. Bait is placed inside, usually cheap, strong-smelling fish such as herring or catfish. The crayfish follows the scent and crawls inside, but its primitive brain is unable to find the way out. The boats used to harvest crayfish are a separate art form. They are flat-bottom boats with a hydraulic drive that pushes them forward through thick mud and vegetation. The fisherman stands at the bow and at incredible speed hauls up the traps. 
dumps out the catch and throws them back without stopping for even a second. You cannot just toss the freshly caught crayfish straight into the pot. First, they must be rinsed and held in clean water to flush mud and silt from their intestines. This process is called purging. Sometimes salt is added to the water and people believe this makes the crayfish empty. It's digestive tract faster, although scientists debate whether this method really works. Traditional crawfish boils in Louisiana are social events. A huge pot of boiling water receives generous handfuls of cayenne pepper, lemons, onions, garlic, and special spice blends without any restraint. The water must be fiery red from the seasoning, so hot that the steam alone makes it hard to breathe. Along with the crayfish, people often throw corn on the cob, new potatoes, and smoked sausage into the pot. Everything is cooked until done, then the contents of the pot are dumped right onto a table covered with newspaper. No plates and no forks. Everyone eats with their hands, twisting off tails and sucking the juices from their heads. It is the cephalothorax, which many beginners throw away without thinking, that actually holds the richest flavour. That is where the hepatopancreas is, an organ that plays the role of both liver and pancreas. It is a fatty, creamy, yellow substance that gourmets call crayfish butter. But let us return to the dark side. In 1973, driven by good intentions, one entrepreneur brought the red swamp crayfish to Spain, to the region of Extremadura and to the Ebro River Delta. He dreamed of feeding Europe with cheap delicacies. It became the start of an ecological disaster on a continental scale, see her. The crayfish, as you might expect, escaped. The local conditions seemed like a resort to them. Mild winters, no natural predators such as alligators and raccoons, and food in abundance. They began to reproduce at a frightening rate. A female red swamp crayfish can lay up to 600 or 700 eggs at a time and can do this twice a year. By comparison, European noble crayfish, the original inhabitants of these waters, reproduce much more slowly and require perfectly clean, cool water. The American newcomer did not just outnumber them, it brought with it a biological weapon against which the local species had no defence. This weapon is crayfish plague. It is a fungal disease to which the red swamp crayfish is immune. It carries the spores but does not get sick. For European species, however, contact with the spores means certain death. Any body of water where the American crayfish appeared quickly became a graveyard for native crayfish. And trouble never comes alone. The red swamp crayfish is omnivorous in the broadest sense of the word. It acts like an underwater lawnmower, destroying macrophytes, the aquatic plants that provide shelter and food for fish and insects. A lake where it appears quickly turns from a blooming garden into a muddy puddle. It does not shy away from animal food either. Fish eggs, tadpoles, mollusks, dragonfly larvae, all of it fuels its insatiable metabolism. In some lakes in Kenya, where the crayfish was introduced to fight snails that carry schistosomiasis, it ate not only the snails, but practically everything that could move slower than its claws. It is especially dangerous for amphibians. Newts and frogs, which evolved for millions of years without such an aggressive predator, turned out to be completely defenseless. The crayfish finds their eggs and larvae, and sometimes attacks adults, biting off their legs or tails. In China, the story repeated itself, but with local flavor. Brought to Nanjing from Japan back in the 1930s, the crayfish long remained food for poor people, or feed for livestock. However, in the 1990s, a culinary boom began, and the small red crayfish that locals call Xiao Longxia became the king of street food. The Chinese, great lovers of anything that swims or crawls, learned to cook it in enormous quantities. Hot chili peppers, Sichuan pepper, oil, garlic and beer. That is the recipe for success. Today, China is the largest producer of red swamp crayfish in the world, raising millions of tons every year. Yet even in China, where it often seems that people eat everything, the crayfish still causes harm. It destroys the terraces of rice paddies that farmers built over centuries. Its burrows disrupt the hydrology, the water drains away, and the rice dries out. Peasants are forced to spend huge sums to repair dams and reinforce banks with concrete. Here is an interesting fact about survival. 
If a body of water dries out completely, and even in the burrow it becomes too dry, the red swamp crayfish can enter a state of suspended animation. All processes in its body slow to an extreme minimum. In this condition, it can remain for months, looking like a dried mummy, but a few drops of water are enough to bring it back to life. The aggression of this species is striking. If two males meet on a narrow path, a fight is inevitable. They lock claws and try to tear off each other's limbs. Losing a claw is not a tragedy for it. Thanks to regeneration, after a couple of molts, a new claw will grow back, even if it is slightly smaller. Cannibalism is normal behavior for the red swamp crayfish. The strong eat the weak, adults eat the young. This is a built-in mechanism for population control. If the population becomes too dense, they simply start eating each other, freeing up living space for the strongest and most aggressive individuals. One of the boldest yet most controversial ideas was an attempt to sterilize the males. Scientists captured them, exposed them to radiation, and released them back in the hope that they would mate with females without producing offspring, lowering the population. In practice, however, the species resilience won again. Sterile males lost competition to wild alpha males, and the females simply found healthy partners. Evolution provided protection, even from the atomic age. In Kenya, on Lake Naivasha, the situation turned into an economic tragedy. The crayfish destroyed stands of papyrus and lotus, depriving local tilapia of spawning grounds. Fishers who had lived off tilapia catches for centuries suddenly lost their livelihoods. Now they are forced to catch the crayfish itself, but they can sell it only for pennies, since the local culture of eating this product is almost non-existent, and export requires expensive logistics. This story took an unexpected turn in medicine and biotechnology, the shell of the red swamp crayfish. The very waste that piles up by the ton after feasts turned out to be valuable raw material. From it, producers extract ketosan, a unique biopolymer. It is used to make self-dissolving surgical sutures, artificial skin for burn treatment, and even systems for delivering drugs directly to cancer tumors. A destroyer of ecosystems has, in a paradoxical way, become a savior of human lives. What about the countries of the former Soviet Union? Until recently, many believed that harsh winters would be a reliable shield against this heat-loving aggressor. But the climate is changing, and the red swamp crayfish has already been found in the warm waters of canals near some thermal power plants and in southern regions. Enthusiast aquarists releasing unwanted pets into city ponds are unknowingly running a dangerous experiment. If this species adapts to the cold, the consequences for local river crayfish could be fatal. This species is a perfect example of how natural selection works in the age of the Anthropocene. It is not the strongest or the fastest, but it knows how to wait, endure, and adapt to any conditions that humans create. We pollute the water. It thrives. We build canals. It uses them as highways. We alter the climate, and that only expands its range. Today, this species is firmly embedded in the global ecosystem, whether we like it or not. It can no longer be completely eradicated, only contained. Write in the comments what you think about this species.